Okay. Okay.
Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome. Why don't y'all grab your hymn books? Hymn number 185. Let's all stand. We'll sing My Savior's Love. Hymn number 185. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene, and I wonder how he can love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. Oh, how marvelous, Oh, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Hymn number 185, on the second verse. For me it was in the garden, he prayed not my will but thine. He had no tears for his own grief, but sweat drops of blood for mine. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. On oh, at last, when with the ransom the glory, his face I at last shall see. Will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. Oh, how marvelous! Oh, how wonderful! And my song shall ever be. Oh, how marvelous! Oh, how wonderful is my Savior's love. And Andrew, why don't you go to open some prayer, please? Heavenly Father, Lord, I'm thankful this night that we can gather on our hearts and know more about you and be free with anyone else who might be traveling in. Please give them safety and be free with callers tonight and please give them more to say and help us learn something from it and be free with their star and Miss Sola as we'll be traveling back on. Thou then just give them safety also. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. A few moments. Uh, before we do the, the memory verse, um, just really one announcement, uh, which is July 4th, which is this weekend. Uh, services at 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock. Uh, well, most people are over here. So it wasn't just you, I assure you, Carlos. Guilty conscience or something. Okay. Guilty conscience. That's all I got to say. Um, so 10 o'clock and then 11 o'clock, uh, July 4th. Um, uh, also, I'd like to thank all the guys that came out this past Tuesday. It got done. It got done quickly, mostly painlessly, and uh, everyone is here is still live, so it's good. The only one we're missing is, I think, Buzz. I know he's here around somewhere, but uh, thank you guys. It got done quickly. I'm happy, so it's good. Um, and then um, pray for Pastor. He... Um, should be traveling home, I think, Saturday. He'll be with us on Sunday. So uh, final VBS day is tomorrow. So uh, that leaves Saturday. So that's a good guess. But uh, pray for him. He's probably preaching right about now-ish uh, or soon. I guess it's an hour behind. So, uh, so pray for him and his travels. He'll be back with us on Sunday. And I think that's about it. So we got a verse. Good evening. Got a new verse. If you go with me to 1 John, new month, we got a new memory verse, 1 John chapter 2. First John chapter 2, looking at verse 10 when you get there. All right, 1 John 2, 10. If you could read that nice and loud with me, it says, 
He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. That's 1 John 2, 11 to 10. That's our new verse. Looking forward to working on that together. Tom? Okay. Grab your hymn book one more time. Hymn 468. Isn't he wonderful? Let's all stand. And uh, 468. We'll sing it twice. Jesus, my Lord, wonderful. Eyes have seen, ears have heard, it's recorded in God's Word. Isn't Jesus, my Lord, wonderful? One more time. Isn't He wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Isn't Jesus, my Lord, wonderful? Eyes have seen, ears have heard, it's recorded in God's Word. Isn't Jesus, my Lord, wonderful? Excellent singing. Go to be seated. Carlos. All righty. Wow, that is loud. Okay, we are going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Hopefully you don't have to hear my booming voice like that all night. <laughs> no, I'm just joking around. It's all good. <laughs> all right, so 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and it's a short chapter, only 13 verses, and we're mostly all familiar with it. It's all about charity, and that's going to be the main topic of today, charity or more to break it down more, the Greek word that agape, that charity is used, and we're going to go into that and just how much it's needed and how hard it actually is. So I'm just going to go ahead and read the whole chapter. And it says, Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long, and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see though a gra through a glass darkly, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I know even, also, even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for your word tonight, Lord, and we thank you that we can just open up this Bible, Lord, and just learn so much from it. And Lord, as we talk about charity tonight, Lord, help us to keep in mind that we need to have this at all times, Lord. Just this love that you gave to us, Lord, and that we as your children should be reflecting down on this earth, Lord. And I just ask for your wisdom and guidance, Lord, and through this message, Lord. And just thank you for all things you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so you guys already knew, I cannot stand the heat, so this has to come off. I try not to freeze you all, because I would love to turn it down to like 64 degrees in here, but I, charity, okay, I love you guys, not enough to freeze you. 
But you see, we're, we're going to talk about love tonight, and agape, the word that is used for charity, means an, like an all-giving love. You know, you're putting it out there. You do anything. You give of yourself for it. And it, it's, it's so easy to say, I love you, or, you know, I love God, I love the things of God. But to actually go out and do those things, to prove that love, is so much more difficult than just saying it. It is not easy to do. And we, our whole faith, our whole relationship with God is broken down into love. And in Matthew chapter 22, and I was joking with the guys who have been preaching before me, because a lot of these verses I've had down were already talked about. I told Sean he saw my notes on Friday when he was here. But in Matthew chapter 22, we, we, we see what Jesus says about love. And I'll start in 34. But when the Pharisees, the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees in silence, they were gathered together. And one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And you see, even as they're trying to trip him up and, you know, prove Jesus wrong, even then Jesus is still just proving his love and just giving this answer of pure love. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, you see, the word love here is the exact same word as charity that we saw all throughout 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This needs to be our whole faith. We need to have that love. And that love, as I said, is just so hard sometimes. So back in our scripture, back in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we're just going to look through some of these verses and just see what we can pull from it. But, you know, when I came here on Friday, I, was do I planned on doing a lot of work when I first came here on Friday. And I went into the pastor's office because I wanted the Bible dictionary to look something up. And then I looked at his bookshelf, and I ended up pulling a couple of books. I, I think I spent like two, maybe three hours reading books instead of working on my message. But there was this, there was this book, C.S. Lewis, The Four Loves, and, and I just saw this quote in there, and I just had to pull it out because it just, it, it, it just fits so perfectly. And it says, the father gives all he is and has to the son. The son giveth himself back to the father and gives himself to the world, and for the world to the father, and thus gives the world and himself back to the father too. And you just see this cycle God the Father gave everything to Jesus. Jesus gave everything to, back to the Father. Jesus gave everything to the world. And then in return, the world back to the Father. And you see, we, being saved, have received that love. So you, you, you look at that, you know, God gave all his love to us. So in turn, we should be giving all our love to God. It's simple. It, it makes so much sense. And yet... Flesh makes that most impossible thing in the world. We can never love quite like God can. I mean, God has done so many things that we would just hesitate to do. I mean, we, we all know John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That, that's that love. That is all giving. And I, I look at myself and think, could I do that? That's, that's not easy. That is not something we can just say, oh, absolutely, I, I could do that, no problem. That, it, it, if you say that, that's a lie. This love does not come just easy to us. But in these first three verses in chapter 13, I, I look at this and we see that charity is so important because everything else without charity is for naught. It, it's almost pointless when you don't do things with with charity, love, as it says. And I, I think how easy it is for us to, we'll say, strong dislike, almost like a hatred of things in this world. 
I mean, if you've been driving on these roads for anything over an hour, you've had a strong dislike for somebody on that road. Or you go to the store, and you're in that line for 15 or less items, and you see that person who has like 15 to 30 items. Love is not going through your head at that moment, is it? You're just thinking, really? Mm, this person. See, it, it, it's, it's so easy for us just to have that dislike and not this love. But the Lord has given people so many things. He has given us this love. It, not a problem. <laughs> it happens to all of us. I, I make sure I always have the fear my phone or something is going to go off. So trust me, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> not a problem but as I'm saying th th this love is it it's important because without these things and we see verse 1 though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. Think, think about this. You know, street preaching, street preaching is a great thing. So, you know, it can be so fruitful. But have you ever seen those people who are preaching and you can tell there's not a drop of love in that message? Who here would be saved if I came up to you and said you're the worst person ever, you deserve hell, you should need, need to get God? Who is responding to that? That is not love. And you see, that without love, that message is as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. If I have this great faith, I have this amazing prayer life, and I make it all about me and never pray for a single other person, where's the love there? Love, charity, is so important because you take it out of all these gifts and there's just nothing happening there. And, you know, when we look at this word charity in this current day and age, we almost always think of money. And I think, have you ever donated money? You usually do that out of love, right? If you're giving someone money, it's of love. Taxes, on the other hand, who here gives taxes that lovingly? You guys love to give taxes? When that bill comes to say, let's increase those taxes, you know, absolutely, because I love everybody. Absolutely not. So even in the idea of giving, it has to be done with love. It, and again, it's not easy. But going back to the first point I made of trying to share the gospel with somebody, you're not doing it with love. It's not going to go far. I mean, all these letters that we see from missionaries of people getting saved, and, you know, you hear someone sharing a testimony like, oh, I've been at a Bible study with somebody. You can, you, just, you can hear, you can feel the love when they're talking about that stuff. They're making the connections with love. And through that love, God is performing miracles there. But it's through that love. So if we don't have that love, if, you, if you're doing all these things and there's just no love there, it's just, it's so pointless. And then my next point, you know, we see that without charity, everything's pretty much for naught. But the second point is charity is not easy to keep. It is not easy. I mean, we see in verse 4, it says, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinking no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity but rejoices in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Just that first part of even talking about suffering long, you know, loving someone is going to, you need some long suffering to deal with that. If you are dealing with someone who absolutely can't stand you, is it easy to have that love for them still? You've got you to gotta be long-suffering because you are going to suffer when dealing with people. Whether they even like you or they hate you, it's still going to be a long-suffering process. And I already talked about how easy it is for us as Christians to have a strong dislike. 
Those people who don't feel the love of God have such a stronger hate. And we need to be able to suffer through that. We need to be able to take that hate on and still show love. And, you know, you look at throughout the Bible, there are some great examples of people who have had some terrible suffering and still had a strong love. You know, I think of someone like Stephen. Stephen is preaching a message knowing that they're pretty much going to kill him when he's finished with this. And yet he still goes through with it. And even at the end, when they're actually killing him, what's the thought that goes through his head? Almost the exact same as Jesus. Lord, don't, don't put this on them. That is a love. That is a long-suffering love that he had right there. And it is not, not easy. You know, it, it's... It's easy to love someone who loves you. It's so easy to deal with people who like you. But when you're talking about dealing with hate, and people will hate you for all type of things. Race, gender, religion, of course, culture, sports teams. There are people who hate you for your sports teams. I mean, here I am as a Yankees fan. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Yankees fan and a church full of Phillies fans. Man. Thankfully, you guys don't hate me for being a Yankees fan. I get a lot of comments about it, but you guys don't hate me for it. But there are legit people who will hate you for something as simple as a sports team. Politics, hatred, living on the wrong area, hatred. It's so, so easy. There's so much hatred in this world. And in Luke... Chapter 6, you see talk of loving people. If you go with me to Luke chapter 6, it really makes you understand how much we need to stand out in our love. And Luke chapter 6, and I'm going to start in verse 27. And it says, But I say unto you, which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. And unto him that smiteth thee on one cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. Let's just look at that one right Just look at that real quick. Unto him that smiteth thee on one cheek, offer the other. Have you ever had someone who's wronged you? Is your first thought, I need to forgive them? If you're, in the, if you're feeling the love, if you are showing that all-giving love, that's the first thought. The flesh is not saying that in the slightest. You know, I have worked with someone who immediately threw me under the bus for something I wasn't even involved with. And then the next day wanted to act like my best friend because apparently that never happened. I'll tell you, the flesh was answering there. I'm just like, how dare you come to me like you didn't just get me in trouble? But then I had to start thinking on that and thinking, okay, I need to forgive them. Because if I'm not showing that love, they're not going to receive any kind of gospel there. That's for sure. So I have to forgive them. And to actually turn that other cheek is not easy. And Jesus even had to answer that before when they were talking about how many times do I have to turn the cheek? Okay, after seven times, can I just say I'm done with this person finally? God's, Jesus, absolutely not. It, it's almost like it doesn't matter what they do to you, you need to show them love. It's difficult, very, very difficult to show love. And as I said before, it, when you're talking about someone who hates you, but still try to show love is not easy, and it's not going to come naturally. Which brings me to my next point. Charity requires action. It requires so much action. Because I can say I love and forgive somebody, but if I'm not proving that, if there's no actual love there, 
Like, I can easily tell you guys, I love you guys. If you need anything, just call me. And when you call me at 2 in the morning, I'm going to click the ignore button. <laughs> All giving love, I have to answer that call. 2 in the morning is actually fine. I'm awake. If you call me at 7 in the morning, that is trying me. <laughs> but you see, it requires action. If someone hates you, they are not going to wake up the next day and absolutely love you. That is not ever going to happen. That just does not instantly change in their mind. Like, oh, I'm going to love this person. Same way, we're not just going to wake up one day and say, oh, well, I love God now. It, it, we might say something like that, but the actual all-giving love? No, that, that has to be in action. That has to be, you know, you have to see love. This, this love isn't just something that you can say you have and do nothing with. You think of someone like Ananias, and well, in uh, Acts chapter 9, if you want to turn there, and you guys know in Acts chapter 9, we're, we're talking about Paul. Everybody loves Paul the Apostle, such a great person to love. But think about how hard it would have been to love Saul of Tarsus, this man who like I've talked about, literally wants to get you killed for your faith. And yet we see this man who has this love. So in Acts chapter 9, and I'll start in verse 10, and, and this is right after, you know, literally right after Saul's getting saved, we see, and there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarshish. For behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. And Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at G Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And I just love this next verse. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, have sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. That is a love right there. Because if I told you to go to someone who said they want to kill you and said, God wants you to go talk to them right now, the love that you need to actually go and do that because having the faith and believing God, I, okay, Lord, I believe you. That man is saved. I believe you. But do I need to be the one who needs to go talk to him? Ooh. Do you, do you love the Lord? Are you giving? Or are you loving this person who absolutely hates you? Not easily or not. It, it, it is such an odd thing to think that one of the greatest men you will ever read about started off as one of the evilest men you would never want to deal with. And yet, through love, he was saved and became one of the greatest apostles. And that goes back to Stephen again. He was there when Stephen got killed. He heard that message. And the next time we see Saul is when he's getting saved, and God's talking to him how, you know, it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. He was already struggling with those thoughts in his head of what he would have heard from someone who loved him to the point of death. And it, it, it's, it's amazing, amazing how much that love can really do in this world. If we can honestly just be showing that love out in this world, it can have amazing effects. We may not think it. We may struggle with it. But when you take that action... When you're actually going out and doing those things, it's amazing what you can see. 
And, you know, as I was doing this study, I was looking all throughout the Bible at the word agape. You know, pulled out the Strong's numbers, looked at all the examples. And there are a lot of examples. And then there was one thing that just really struck me as odd. If you go with me to John chapter 21. And this is that familiar story of Jesus and Peter. Lovest thou me more than these? And it's an amazing, beautiful story to think about and a real challenge. But as I was looking through these verses, and you can see the word love is there a lot. But there's actually a disconnect between the word that Jesus is using and the word that Peter is using. See, Jesus is saying, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He's using agape. He's saying, Peter, are you willing to give everything? And Peter is answering, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He's using phileia, you know, Philadelphia, brotherly love. He's using a brotherly love version back to Jesus. He's saying, Lord, I would do anything for you. You see, there's a disconnect there. Jesus is saying, I need you to give. And Peter is saying, well, I'll, I, I will, you know, I, I will do it. And immediately Jesus responds, feed my lambs. Go out and show that love. And then you get the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Again, agape. And again, Peter responds, Philea, yeah, of course, I'll do anything for you, Lord. Feed my sheep. I need you to go out and show that love. But the third time, is when Jesus actually uses the same word that Peter is using, his brotherly love. And he says, he says, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And he uses that same word that Peter's been using. And it's at this point that Peter's thinking, okay, something is wrong. And that's when Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And it just starts working on Peter, you see. I love you, and I will do what you want me to do out of love. Two different things. They should both be there, but this all-giving love is just, it, it, you need to go out. And again, Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. The action, go. You know, we're all told, verse right up there, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You need love to go out and do that. There's the action. There's the proof of the love. You're going out there. You're, you're showing that love. And this, you know, this whole story pretty much ends. We, we, we know that Peter does have that, he has that love. He struggles with it sometimes, but he has that love. And you see in verse 18, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest, but when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, follow me. It makes it pretty clear that Peter had that love. Because Peter was going to serve the Lord to his death. He was literally going to be killed for that serving the Lord for that love. And almost all the apostles go through this. All of them have that love that they're giving, which is ultimately going to get them killed. And you think of someone like our missionary Noah George, who is literally in an area where they hate what he is doing. Man, there is some love there. And this man has been detained. He's been separated from his family at points. He has to pretty much think every time he's sharing a gospel that he might just be killed right then and there. And he keeps doing it. There's love there. But then he starts thinking, where's, where's that love for us? And I, I tell you, I, I struggle with that love. That, that's, it's not easy. It is not something that is just passive for us. It, it's difficult to do. 
You know, I was reading this other book, as I told you, I pulled a couple of books from pastor's office. And there was just another quote. I just had to share this because this is very true. Southern iced tea is not iced tea with sugar. It is sugar with iced tea. Life is like iced tea without sugar. It can be very bitter. But the more love you add, the better it becomes. We need to add love to our lives like Southerners add sugar to their iced tea. Now, who's actually had real Southern iced tea? It is delicious. I am a diabetic. I cannot even be drinking that anymore. But it is delicious. And anyone who's actually had that knows this is a very true statement. There are like pounds of sugar in that iced tea. Now, think about adding your love like that. If your love is like that, Iced tea is your life, the sugar is your love. Can we match that? Can we be putting that out, that much love? Can you show that in everything you do, in our service to the Lord? And you can leave your life bitter, just like the iced tea without sugar. Sugarless iced tea, it's all right. Iced tea with sugar, good. Southern iced tea, delicious. You can leave it down here. And that's not going to be doing what God wants. There's going to be no love there. If you can bring it up here and show, you know, a generous amount of love. And you're seeing the fruit from it, but you're not seeing a lot. Or we can add all that love. And we can start seeing the miracles that God can perform when that love is going out into the world. When you're taking that person who absolutely hates you, you're taking that bitter, sweet life and adding love to it. It can do so, so much. But again, it's not easy. You go back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We, we see that the, this continues. It, it, it doesn't just get easier. But we, we also see this amazing, amazing verse in 8. 1 Corinthians 13, 8. It says, Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. You see, we, prophecies, preaching, you know, all these things, none of us know the whole, what's going on completely. No one is going to read this Bible and know absolutely everything about it. But what you can know is the love of God. And what you can put out is the love of God. And you see, charity never faileth. There have been so many situations where you just walk away and think, you know, I don't think that person got anything out of that. You've handed, you've, you've handed somebody a track, and you, see, you just see them put it in their pocket, don't even remotely look at it, and that thought is instantly right there. They're probably throwing that away the moment I walk away. And yet, charity never faileth. If you're doing this with love, there is an effect there. If you're having a discussion with somebody who is just tearing apart your faith and you're still showing that love and you're still putting it out there and you walk away thinking that person absolutely didn't get a thing out of it. But maybe that night, maybe in a week, maybe a couple of years later, they can have an effect. You know, I remember I had a supervisor I couldn't stand my supervisor. We had a lot of disagreements. But I would still talk to him about church things. Because he went to, I want to say it was a Presbyterian church. And we were just having random talks. And eventually we got on the topic of child baptisms. Because he was just about to have a child. And he was talk we were talking about baptism. And he was like, you know, I'm being pressured at my church to baptize my child. And so we were talking about that, you know, how, I mean, obviously that's not scriptural. 
there's no benefit to putting your child under water or even sprinkling water. There's zero benefit to it. You know, despite the problems I've had with my supervisor, I'm still talking to him about this. And literally, about a couple years later, he told me, I'm looking for a church that actually follows the Bible. How I felt when I had that conversation with him, there was nothing there. When he mentioned to me that, you know, I'm actually looking for a church that preaches the gospel, that, that's an amazing. I got to see firsthand, love doesn't come empty. It is never pointless. And you, you, when you have that idea, when, when you're actually remembering that no matter what you're doing, if you're doing it in godly love, it actually has a point. That, that's going to stick in your mind. And that's going to have that effect. And you know, there, there is so much, so, so much that we don't want to do. Because sometimes we're not in that love. Sometimes we struggle to have this action love. Sometimes we doubt if that love is going to have any effect. If I hand that tract out, is it going to matter? If I actually share the gospel with this person who looks like they don't care about a thing of God, will it matter? And it does. I mean, again, look at Saul. Saul became Paul. Now imagine if no one ever had that love for him and shared the gospel with him. Imagine how many men and women as well who would have never received the gospel because someone didn't love them enough to share it. It is so amazing. And you know, when I was going through just this word, going all throughout the Bible, there are some amazing scriptures. There are some amazing examples of what love can do. And then you start to think, where is that in me? You know, you, you want to serve God? And you know, you have these gifts for God? But love has to be there first. I mean, I can tell you right now, without the love of God, I'm definitely not up here. I know where I was before I got saved. I know where exactly where I would be if someone didn't love me enough to share the gospel with me. And it definitely would not have been in a church. I have had friends who have died from drugs, alcoholics, and I know exactly where they are right now, even though it's a work night tomorrow. I know exactly where they are. And that could have been me. That, that could have been me living a life that, at the end, I would be nothing but regrets and emptiness. But someone loved me enough to share the gospel. Someone loved me enough to say, hey, you should come to this youth group. Hey, have you ever heard this scripture? I'll mess with Diane because she's not here. Diane loved me enough to invite me to this church. And you guys might have missed this Yankee fan being a part of this church. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Love is amazing. This all-giving love is just so amazing. But there's a danger. And this point I want to make now is charity, love, does not mean giving people everything they want. There are a lot of people who seem to mistake love as just, I'll give you everything. You want this? I'll get it for you. And that is far from love. That, that, that's just neglect. And 2 Timothy 3.16, you know, you, you, you guys mostly all know that. But correction and righteousness, reproof. Most people don't think reproving someone or correcting them or giving them instruction is done in love. God, God did that to us out of love. We need to be able to do that to others out of love. 
Uh, imagine you know somebody who's doing something so sinful, a brother or sister, you know they're doing something sinful, and you don't say anything out of that? That's not love. Again, that's just neglect. And I look at Jesus dealing with Peter, and we all love the pig on Peter because the Bible just points out all these examples of things Peter did. Imagine if Jesus just never actually corrected him, never actually said anything. Just like, oh, yeah, Peter, yeah, I know. And we've all had that attitude with somebody. We've all just had it up to here, and we just like, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just do what you want. Even Paul, Paul the Apostle, stood up to Peter when Peter made a mistake. Now, mind you, Peter was an apostle before Paul. Peter was looked at as like the head apostle over everybody. But when Paul saw him do something wrong, Paul went and said, hey, this isn't right, and you need to fix this. That's love. And I... I can't imagine how difficult that had to have been for Paul. I don't think he was looking forward to correcting Peter. I really hope you're never looking forward to correcting someone. But if you love them, you will. If you love them, you're going to want to help them get back to God. So while sometimes we might just want to give them everything they want, you know, sometimes you've got that friend who wants to call you and say, hey, since you don't drink, could you pick me up? You know, could you take me out tonight? And I could just say, oh, yeah, fine, you know, I love you. I'm, oh, I got you. I'm there for you. Or I can say I cannot support that. I, I, I can try to fix a problem that I see. Maybe I have a Christian brother or sister who is doing something. And I see it. And I can just let them keep going. Or I can say, hey, can we talk real quick? Can we look at, can we look at the scriptures? You know, can we just talk about what God says? Because ultimately, if what someone is doing is not something that God approves, then not say anything. Now, don't say it out of a hateful spirit or you just want to prove your superiority. Again, it has to be done out of love. Because if you ever came to me and just tried to tear me down, I could be wrong. I could be so far away from God. But if you came at me with an angry spirit, I'm probably going to go further away. And there are people who have left churches because of that. Because people have come to them with an angry spirit and not a spirit of love. So love is very important. Charity is so, so important. And it plays a major part in how we should be practicing our faith. God loved you. God sent his son to die for you. He also sent his son to die for those people out there who are in the club tonight, who are drunk, who are passed out out of drugs that person that you just look and just think, there's no way they want God. God still sent Jesus to die for them. God has that love. And we know that verse, but God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So can you have that love? Can you look at someone and think, They need the scripture right now. Can you take a moment to think, okay, I can hand them a track. I can share my testimony. I can try to fix this relationship with someone who hates me for something I can't even control. There are a lot of atheists who I've dealt with who absolutely just can't stand the moment you mention anything about God. If you said God bless after they sneezed, it's an insult to them. They still need the gospel. And I I can't do anything to them without love. Because if I don't show that charity, 
if they see even the slightest bit of hatred or anger, going back to long suffering, you know, you, you have to be able to take that and bear it. Verse 7, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you think, no matter what the situation you're in or someone else is in, charity is how you're going to get that, through that situation. Charity is how you need to approach that situation. Our entire spiritual journey focuses on those two things, as I read before. Loving the Lord with all thy heart. And you think you have that done. But if you're not loving your neighbor with all thy heart, then you're not loving the Lord with all your heart. And, you know, some people want to think, okay, who's a neighbor? Everybody. Everybody is a neighbor. We know that story of the Good Samaritan. And the reason Jesus used the Samaritan in that story is because they hated Samaritans. And yet Jesus was pretty much putting it out there like, that Samaritan showed God's love more than any of God's people did. There is not a single person that doesn't need loving gospel. It's not a single person who can't profit from God. There's not a single one of us who can take another step in our spiritual journey without that love of God. You can have the faith. You can have the hope. But in verse 13, you say, you see it, but the greatest of these is charity. Love is where you need to be before anything else. And chapter 14 even starts off with that. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts but rather that ye may prophesy. Follow after charity. Spiritual gifts, they're great, but they need to come after charity. They need to come after that love. And you know, I can go through and I can pull all these verses and I would recommend if you guys ever do a study, to do a, do a study of that. Look at every word that starts with love. Charity. Just... See how much this all-giving love is spread throughout the Bible. Because it's, it's not something as simple as saying, I love you. That word is so overused. We use love for everything. I love a good nap. You see, it's just, it's just overused. But this word agape, the actual meaning of all-giving love, that, that is not used in this world often. That is not the love that we see. And yet, that is the love that we are called to give out. That is the love that God gives to us. That is the love we should be giving back to God and to the world, to each other, and to those out there. You know, this, this country is in a very dark place right now. And there are so many people who are just thinking, I give up. You know, maybe it's better if I just go live in a cabin up in the mountains and not deal with the world, just me and the Lord. That's not a spirit of love. To give a tract to somebody and share your testimony with someone who loves, who absolutely hates you, wants nothing to do with you, that's love. So I, I look at this chapter and I see this challenge of love needs to be in everything. Love needs to suffer. You need to be able to suffer. You need to be able to not puff it up yourself. Think, okay, because I love you, I'm better than you. Because I'm saved, I'm better than you. That, that's one of the most upsetting things that when someone tries to share the gospel and they present themselves as better because they have God. You're no different than those out there. You started off lost. We were all sinful. I can, I can tell you right now, using this example like Stephen did, the other thing, if you pulled up the list of sins I did, I definitely wouldn't be in this church right now. I can tell you that. If you saw the thoughts that have gone through me, if you saw where I was before I wasn't saved, I was 
not in a great mindset before I received the gospel. I'll tell you that. But someone loved me and shared the gospel. And I, I, I see this challenge and I put it forth to myself and I hope you put it forth to yourself to have that love at all times, to make a better effort of putting that love out into the world. Going back to that example of the iced tea, how much sugar can you add to it? How much can you keep adding that love? How much can we emulate God's love? Because we'll never be there. We'll never be able to get to that level that God loves us. But we can build our way up to it. So let's make that our mission. To have charity be the greatest thing. To have love towards God and others. That we can, that someone else can see the love of God in you. Let's strive for that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, oh Lord, you have been the greatest example. Lord, you have loved us sinners who did not deserve your love, did not deserve your grace, who did not deserve the gift of salvation, and yet, Lord, you loved us. Lord, help us. Help us to take that love you gave us and put it back towards you, Lord. And Lord, to shine that love upon the world Help us to take your love out into the world and share it, Lord. Lord, that there can be fruit from it. That souls can be saved, Lord, and that we can grow closer to you and have a better walk with you, Lord. Help us in these things. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can all just...